right, the recording has started. Let's uh, pray together and then continue. Uh, could uh, any one of us lead in prayer, please? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Dear God, thank you so much for today, Lord, that you allow us to be about to know the life of the so called and the book of life's life, that you fill us with your wisdom and knowledge from your spirit, God. Thank you for everything that you're about to teach us and for us to understand, Lord. And I pray, Lord, especially in this teaching us, Lord, that you fill us with your wisdom and your spirit, and that power to pray for each one of our classes, God, that you give us wisdom and knowledge and to grasp what Pastor is going to be teaching to us, God. Thank you for your love and your kindness. And thank you for the Lord for healing people and destroying people's lives. In your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Asha, for leading in prayer. Um, we will start off with uh, Acts chapter 13. As uh, you know, we've seen so far uh, from Acts chapter 2 to 8, we saw more of the first five, first eight years so uh, acts 2 to acts 8 uh, is about eight years ad 30 to ad 38 um, where we saw that the church was born and the church was in revival and uh, as we went ahead from acts chapter 8 to acts chapter 13 um, uh, this is again uh, something like a decade about nine nine years or ten years time uh, and uh, so now from the birth of the church to uh, acts chapter 13 it's almost you know uh, 17 years so we've got to remember that so it's been 17 years since the baptism in the holy spirit took place at uh, uh, on the day of pentecost so 17 long years uh, many believers have been one for christ churches have been planted in different cities churches have been strengthened in different cities uh, we have uh, leaders as of now some who are known some who are unknown we have the apostles who are providing leadership to all the churches you know across the region they are of course based out of the church of jerusalem uh, but they are providing leadership to all the other churches we also saw that there was a young person uh, by the name of uh, saul who encountered the lord jesus in acts chapter 9 and uh, he is uh, said to have been about the age of 29, somewhere there, 29 uh, to 33 years. That's what, uh, um, you know, theologians uh, assume his age to be. And uh, he came to know the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And then, you know, he begins to make his journey in ministry. We saw how, uh, you know, he started his work uh, almost immediately, but he was not uh, accepted because people thought that he was be he could have could be an imposter or he could be uh, you know falsely uh, pretending that he is following Jesus so those were the issues but we know eventually uh, we saw how Barnabas when he wants somebody to help him in the church of Antioch he goes and he brings uh, Saul and you know, by now, you know, we we uh, we are referring to him as Paul, and uh, that's because you know he had two names: a Jewish name and a Roman name. So that's how. So uh, he is more famous by the name of Paul, and he comes into the picture in the Church of Antioch, and uh, he's seen as one of the prominent leaders there. So Acts chapter eleven was more about the Church of Antioch and how uh, you know that church is established. It's a multicultural church. It's a church where we see uh, leadership as a teamwork. Okay, so it's not that there is only one leader. We also saw that the Church of Antioch was not necessarily planted by any of the apostles. So there is a shift in the way we are looking at 
um, you know the establishment of church and the the oversight of church by a leadership so it's a group leadership that is actually happening here at the church of antioch and then you know, we saw how in acts 12 um, it was a season of persecution but acts 12 revealed a very heightened persecution where the leaders of the church were at uh, risk we saw that james was killed and uh, now uh, there, there was a threat to the life of peter and how peter because of the prayers of the church uh, you know god god supernaturally delivered him so there was an angel that came to uh, his rescue and uh, brought him out and then you know, we we kind of saw the end of uh, the mention of peter here in the uh, book of acts so not that nothing was happening in peter's life but uh, the focus is now shifting to uh, paul and that's what you will notice so 17 years and then you see that the the focus is now going to shift to uh, apostle paul's missionary journeys uh, and then you know we saw the pride of herod um, and how he was he was um, struck for his pride and he died so that's what we've seen till acts chapter 12. so now coming back to acts chapter 13 uh here again it's it's like another 20 years uh, is is what the duration is of acts 13 to acts 28 so roughly about uh, 20 years so ad 48 to ad uh, 67 68 uh, is is what all these you know we we will observe all the things that are going to take place so we will uh, see in acts chapter 13 that uh, uh, Apostle Paul and uh, Barnabas make their first missionary journey. So this first missionary journey is um, of the duration of about two years. So I said that Acts uh, <coughs> Acts chapter thirteen is where you know you you will see a, a focus more on uh, Paul. So how 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 do we um, you know see? Apostle Paul sort of gaining prominence. Yes, he was a leader in the book of, uh, in the church of Antioch. But then we will see that as the leadership of Antioch was praying, God gave them uh, this guidance that they must set aside Barnabas and um, Paul for the, for this missionary kind of a role. And so they are commissioned and then the missionary journeys begin. So it is uh, said that the journey, the first missionary journey which Paul undertook is from AD 44 to AD 46. Okay, so there, I know that there are some overlaps in the timings. Let's not get too um, confused about it because you have different books, different versions giving us different dates. Okay, and um, I don't think we can we can actually come up with the exact date but based on what the writings that are available there is there is a uh, you know like a uh, informed informed uh, guess or uh, or they've come to the conclusion that these would be the dates. so first missionary journey ad 44 to ad 46 so this is from acts chapter 13 verse 1 all the way to acts 14 verse 28 so today we'll try to cover the first missionary journey and uh, before i get into um talking about the first missionary journey i thought it'll be nice if i can show you uh, an image of um you know this missionary journey so just give me a moment yeah sharing my screen with all of you Okay, please 
excuse me, that is just this. Okay, <clears throat> not able to pick a tab, so I'm just going to probably share my screen. Let's see how this works. Okay, are you able to see? Yeah, okay. So now can you see the image? All right. Yes, we can faster. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so here you can see the first missionary journey. We'll notice that Paul and Barnabas, they are the team that undertakes this first missionary journey. Uh, it will begin, obviously, from Antioch. And then you would notice that you know they'll go to this place called uh, Seleucia, um, we don't read too much about any ministry which is done in Seleucia. Maybe it was a, a spot from where they had to, um, you know, take a, a boat or a ship to go to Cyprus. So that's where they went to Seleucia. We don't know, but we cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, it cannot even digest the fact that uh, Barnabas and uh, Paul did nothing. In Seleucia, I'm sure they would have uh, shared the, the gospel with people there as well. So we don't read about much ministry there. But then we see that, you know, they move on from there. So there's a mention of uh, Salamis, uh, the, the region of Cyprus, then Paphos. We will read, um, you know, how they will minister to a, a government official in Paphos and what actually happens there. That will take us to the end of Acts chapter 13. Uh, and then, you know, we will eventually uh, move on. We will see that they go to uh, Perga, uh, Sidia. Uh, so remember, I mentioned earlier, there, were, there are many, kind, many different Antiochs. So that name was given by the ruler uh, to uh, various cities. So you have the Antioch of uh, Sidia over here so don't confuse it with the antioch church that we talked about earlier that would be the syrian antioch so you have the Sidian antioch and from there they will move to iconium okay iconium where they will do some substantial amount of ministry so you know we we will see that we will see how from there they will eventually go to Lystra, they'll go to uh, uh, Derby, and uh, from there you know, they will uh, come back in the same route. So basically from Derby back to Lystra, Iconium, and then you know, take the uh, same route back to Antioch. So you, know, you will see them coming back to Antioch. So uh, missionary journey, the first missionary journey is rather simple. So there are a couple of places involved over here. And uh, you can you can look at it like um, they start off from Antioch, the base church, they move on to certain cities, do the ministry there, then they take the same route back simply because they want to revisit and see you know how the believers are doing whether they are strengthened or not and then you know uh, sort of uh, on the way back encourage the believers and come back to antioch the base church and report the ministry that has been undertaken so this is the overview and this will be very helpful as we go into uh, chapters 13 let's let's hope you know we are able to touch uh, Till chapter 15 but uh, let's you know let's see how it goes so uh yeah that's uh the map of paul's first missionary journey for us okay all right now uh let's get into the chapter here so acts chapter 13 uh what we can do is okay let me see. Maybe I, I'll I'll only read and uh, you know try to explain things fast, fast enough. All right. So Acts chapter thirteen. Uh, so it says now in the church that was at Antioch there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called uh, Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, 
who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So uh, remember we said that there is a team ministry in the church of Antioch and this team is a varied team. So you know Barnabas we know that this uh, person uh, is, is quite mature and you know he's a Levite and we know about his character. Then Simeon. Simeon uh, is uh, referred to as uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Niger here, maybe because he came from uh, some of the African countries and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, that's how they described in those days. And so, you know, it's it's put across in the same way in the Greek language here. So, um, so we understand here that there is, uh, there is a, a difference in ethnicity, okay, of the leadership team. Okay, so that's the beauty of it. Lucius of Cyrene. Now, Lucius of Cyrene also belongs to a different region. So uh, you have people from different places. Okay, very easily we, we can understand that. Then there is uh, Manan who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Okay, so uh, this shows us Herod the Tetrarch is the person who um, beheaded John the Baptist. So if there was someone who was brought up with the Tetrarch, uh, it's likely that uh, Manan was a very rich person. So you see that place, ethnicity, um, social status, it has, it, it is not creating any division. Okay, and that is the beauty of the kingdom of God because, you know, as uh, we read earlier in the Old Testament, God does not look at uh, uh, the face, but he looks at the heart. So for God, uh, you know, our origin, our background, uh, our uh, financial condition, none of this really matters. He picks people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue uh, and you know he redeems them and so uh, it there's a beautiful multicultural team here in Acts chapter 13 where uh, you know as far as the church of Antioch is concerned okay so can we have multicultural churches today of course we can have multicultural churches because there is an example right here in the bible for us of a multicultural church okay then what else do we observe about this team? We see that this team, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The, the Holy, then it says the Holy Spirit said. So it shows us that the leadership had a culture of prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord. So when we notice that they have this kind of a culture. It shows us even today, you know, uh, sometimes when we are in ministry and I'm talking from, you know, whatever uh, little experience I have, uh, it's really possible for us to get so busy with all the responsibilities that have been handed to us uh, at that we have no time for God. We have no time for prayer. You know, we have no time, uh, even as a team, to to seek the Lord. But the beauty of what is being written here is that this team, they not only minister to the people. Obviously, they minister to the people, but they minister to the Lord. So remember, as scriptures teach us, we are kings and we are priests. Priests, what is the duty of priests? Priests minister to the Lord. Okay, uh, so there is this ministry unto the Lord, which is communing with God, which is spending time in His presence, uh, spending time in the Word, you know, spending time in prayer. Uh, and that is a priority. That is a priority. We've seen that, you know, time in prayer was such a priority, uh, even in the earlier years in the book of Acts, but it continues. It continues. And you see how that is the place, the presence of God, while we are seeking God, that God begins to give directions. Sometimes there's no clarity about what we should do because we are not even waiting on the Lord. But this team, as they waited on the Lord, we read here that the Holy Spirit said, in other words, we can hear from God better if we are spending time and seeking him so the holy spirit gave them an instruction what was that instruction now separate to me barnabas and saul for the work to which i have called them so 
is it that Barnabas and Saul were not uh, doing any ministry so far? No, it's not like that. But you see that in God's timetable, in God's plan, God wanted them to uh, fulfill a different role compared to what they were doing earlier. So it was time for that. And which is why the Holy Spirit is telling them, now separate to me these two men for this role that I have for them, to the work to which I have called them. So you see how God calls different people for different tasks or works. So these two men are called. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So you uh, see how the church is so, we use the term spirit-led, because they are taking the instructions of God and they are being obedient to it. So such a quick verse there, finished. You know, God said it, we obeyed it, and we went ahead with that. Plan. So now Barnabas and uh, Saul have to do the work which God has for them. So from verse 4 begins their journey, as I showed you in the map. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had jo John as their assistant. So uh, you notice how the journey is going on. So the first place where you hear about them preaching is Salamis. They also had an assistant. So it was not just two of them, but it was three of them. John, who is John? John Mark. John Mark is the son of Mary. And this Mary is uh, uh, the person in whose home you found the believers praying. Remember in Acts 12, uh, Rhoda came out and then she opened the door. So that is Mary's home. And John Mark is the son of Mary. Uh, and so there are three people. So they have an assistant along with them. So now they continue. So uh, they did a little bit of ministry in Salamis. And now they are in the island of Paphos. What happens here? We are told uh, in Paphos, there is a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Okay, Bar Jesus. We'll see that his name is uh, Elimus also. Uh, now, what, what is the uh, task of this person. It seems like uh, in these times for prominent leaders, they had a prophet uh, and they had a spiritual person, you know, assisting them. Uh, in We don't know exactly how, but sorcerer, it indicates to us that uh, maybe he was engaged in some kind of sacrifices and some, some things so that uh, he can gain uh, some spiritual uh, power and authority for that particular leader. So there is a sorcerer uh, who is associated with a leader. So who is this leader? His name is Proconsul Sergius Paulus. Okay, and the scriptures tell us in verse 7, he was an intelligent man. Okay, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So obviously, uh, uh, it, it is quite well known now that you know, this team, Paul and Barnabas, they are preaching about Jesus. So this intelligent man uh, seems like he was a learner and he wanted to know what Jesus was all about. So he asks uh, Barnabas and Saul, hey, tell me more. You know, he wants to hear about this. But in verse 8, we see Elimus the sorcerer. Bar Jesus, Elimus the sorcerer, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So this shows us that there is, uh, uh, there are spiritual strongholds, spiritual entities or spiritual, um, uh, you know, uh, we know that these are demonic hindrances uh, that come against the preaching of the gospel. So here is an intelligent man, a learner, a uh, person with a high position uh, in, in uh, uh, the government who is willing to hear about Jesus. But what is the problem? There is a spiritual hindrance that is coming through by a sorcerer. And uh, because of that, we are told, 
you know, we we read here, which stood them. So the sorcerer, it's he is stopping or hindering the proconsul from receiving the message of the cross, receiving the message of Jesus. And we are told here that he was seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So even today, there can be people, uh, all categories, who can be hindered spiritually from receiving the gospel. And that is the reason, you know, when we talk about um, people coming to know Christ, yes, we do all the practical things. What are the practical things? You preach the gospel, you go, um, you know, you share, you minister, you hold conferences, you know, so many different things. But one of the main things that we must take note of is prayer spiritual warfare breaking those strongholds in the spiritual realm that form a hindrance to the preaching of the gospel so so clear it is here uh, it, it is uh, over here that there is a spiritual hindrance so how are paul and barnabas going to deal with this so verse 9 then saul who also is called paul so you see he's sort of uh, his name is uh, a different name you know, they, they call him over here. Not that it was a new name given to, to uh, uh, Saul, but he had both names. One was a Jewish name and one was a Roman name. So they just picked, you know, uh, uh, the, the other name which was not used so far. So Paul, Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. So spiritual warfare is happening. And in this case, what happens? Verse 10 and said O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud you son of the devil you enemy of all righteousness will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the lord and now indeed the hand of the lord is upon you and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time so remember acts 5 was a time of judgment where uh, people within the church, within the congregation, um, you had uh, Ananias, Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit, uh, who dropped dead. Now, in this situation also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a judgment. It is coming upon who? It's not coming upon a believer. It's coming upon um, the the person who is sort of the source uh, of the demonic hindrance so can there be people uh, who form a hindrance like you know a spiritual hindrance to the gospel yes we've learned about this when we studied about believers authority there can be people who are empowered by demonic spirits to an extent where they can control you know, uh, individuals, they can control even communities and regions. If you recall, we uh, read about a sorcerer in Acts 8, isn't it? Uh, Simon, Simon the sorcerer, and people called him the God. So yes, there can be human beings who are used by Satan and the demonic powers to uh, stop the light of the gospel from touching people's hearts. So how do Paul and Barnabas deal with it? Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, rebukes uh, Elimus or Bar Jesus and uh, you know he, he proclaims blindness on him. Okay, and what happens then? We read uh, in the middle of Acts, uh, the uh, chapter, verse 11 uh, of Acts 13, and immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So judgment has come upon this individual. Then okay, now that the demonic hindrance is dealt with, what result can we expect? Verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You know, even earlier, uh, Paul and Barnabas were sharing about God, but the proconsul just couldn't receive it or understand it, see it. But once the spiritual hindrance was dealt with, he was able to get it. So this is something all of us uh, should uh, realize when we share the gospel, we've got to deal with spiritual or demonic hindrances okay uh, that is when our work will be effective 
so uh, i hope you're all doing uh, okay i'm going on continuously so i'm just concerned whether yeah uh, you know you are getting what i'm sharing and if you're comfortable with the pace if you have any questions comments so far okay all right so that's good good to know that uh, you know your understanding everyone's okay all right fine that's that's good then let's uh, just continue from there okay wonderful all right so we've seen how the ministry took place in paphos okay so just remember it by region oh, what are all the things that happen in these regions who are the people whom we met in these uh, uh, particular cities so now we are coming to antioch of uh, sidia so verse 13 now when paul and his party set sail from paphos so notice how paul is getting the prominence here okay not to say that Barnabas is not important anymore, but somehow, you know, at that point in time, you could you could say that there was a work for Paul to do, uh, you know, which needed to be mentioned. So the team, which was earlier known as Paul and Barnabas, is now somehow called Paul and his party. Okay, so Paul is getting the prominence here. And also, maybe because uh, this is a, a defense brief, which we've already been talking about. So the focus goes to Paul. So they set sail from Paphos. So they leave this region of ministry, move to the next. They came to Perga in Pamphylia and John. Remember John? John Mark. Um, his, his name is John departing from them return to jerusalem okay so this young assistant he was part of the team now we have no idea why he left paul and barnabas there are a lot of speculations luke doesn't tell us why he left there can be uh, reasons that he was not mature enough uh, or he went for this journey and uh, he felt that it was too tiring for him or um, you know he was not too happy that uh, you know now paul is getting all the prominence because later on we will see that uh, john is actually related to barnabas okay so there could be many reasons why john was not happy but here in verse 13 acts 13 13 we notice john left the team john departing from them returned to jerusalem some people say that he was a young lad and uh, he was very homesick and he wanted to go back you know after all this tedious ministry back to his family okay anyway so now we just have paul and barnabas we'll see what what they do verse 14 but when they departed from perga they came to antioch of sidia in sidia and went into the synagogue on the sabbath day and sat down verse 15 and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying men and brethren if you have any word of exhortation for the people say on so those days there was this uh, openness in the synagogues where any learned person or anyone who had a message to share could come you know to the forefront and they could read scriptures they could share um, uh, what was on their heart so in sidia antioch in sidia there is an opportunity for paul and barnabas to actually share they are being asked by the synagogue people men and brethren if you have any word of exhortation or encouragement for the people say on so they receive this opportunity and notice how uh, paul and barnabas are quite strategic they know where their open doors are they knew that it was the synagogue where they will have an opportunity to preach um, and so they go there to the synagogue and they begin to share so now that they've been asked to talk paul stood up okay again you notice how now suddenly paul 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 you know paul is sharing paul is doing this paul is doing that so paul stood up and motioning with his hand said 
So he begins his sermon or he starts to share with them. So, you know, you would see this whole uh, um, narration. But obviously, the conclusion of this narration is the Lord Jesus. So he wants to bring home the point. You know, he will somehow uh, bring this narration to David and, um, you know, uh, David's generation and Jesus and how Jesus died for our sins and, uh, you know, that uh, we are justified through Jesus. So the point is the gospel. So he wants the people to know the gospel. OK, uh, and we will see the reaction of the audience also after this has been shared. So I want to request somebody to uh, read from verse 16 all the way to verse 41. OK, so that will cover what uh, Paul had to say. So anyone, a long passage there, but uh, if someone can volunteer, that would be wonderful. So can I read? Yes, yes. Okay. So, Paul, uh, so Paul stood, lifted his hands to quiet them and started speaking. Men of Israel, he said, and you God-fearing God Gentiles, listen to me. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them through, uh, through 40 years of wandering into the, in the wilderness. Then he destroyed seven nations of Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of uh, Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I, uh, I want him to do. And it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised savior to Israel. Before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel needed to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. As John was finishing his ministry, he asked, Do you think I am the Messiah? No, I'm not. But he is coming soon, and I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the sandals on his feet. Brothers, you son of Abraham, and also you God-fearing Gentiles, this message of salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as the one the prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read every Shabbat. They found no legal reason, reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. When they had done all that the prophecies said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And over, the, and over a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. And now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors, and God has now fulfilled it for us their descendants by raising Jesus. This is what the second Psalm says about Jesus. You are my son, today I have become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you, a, give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Another Psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. This is not a reference to David, for David had gone, sorry, for David had done the will of God in his own generation, and he died and was buried with our ancestors, and his body decayed. Now, no, it was a reference to someone else, someone whom God raised and whose body did not decay. Brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this uh, man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is declared right with God, something the law, uh, the law of Moses could never do. Be careful, don't let the pro uh, prophet's words apply to you. For they say, look you mockers, be amazed and die. For I am doing something 
in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. Where is 40 tentative? Uh, 41. Okay. okay uh, thank you, Kung, for uh, reading that long passage for us. So as we can see, uh, in what Paul shared, he was coming to the point that uh, Jesus is the son of God and the father has called him uh, his son. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So, you know, he talked about how uh, by inheritance, Jesus uh, is is the you know he is the heir and uh, that he is lord he is king he's the son of god and then we go on to see that he talks about the redemptive work that jesus did how he died for our sins and how god raised him up and that he did not perish okay and uh, he's quoting some psalms he's referring to uh, david uh, you know and and the fact that whatever david spoke was not about himself when david said you will not allow your holy one to see corruption but it was about uh, the lord jesus so you know very clearly paul points to the lord jesus using scriptures so this again tells us that uh, he is speaking in context so the Jews will understand the context when uh, you you sh share the names of their patriarchs and you know you share the scriptures. So they know, they understand, uh, and and maybe they will be open to receive this message. So Jesus is preached to these Jews in the synagogue at Antioch of Sidia, and uh, you know uh, very clearly Jesus is proclaimed so verse 42 let's see you know what happens after this message is proclaimed it says so when the jews went out of the synagogue the gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next sabbath so there are some god-fearing gentiles who also want to hear the message so uh sounds good sounds like you know uh they are being respected and their message is being received very well because another group now wants to hear the message verse 43 now excuse me when the congregation had broken up many of the jews and devout proselytes followed paul and barnabas who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of god so there were a group of uh, Jews and Gentiles who received this message well. Paul and Barnabas encouraged them to grow in the Lord. Verse 44. So remember the another meeting invitation. Next Sabbath, you come to us. So what happens? On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So sounds like um, this um, mission missions effort is successful, isn't it? But we'll see you know, what takes place later. So the whole city comes together, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, okay, so when they when the Jews saw this new dynamics that hey, come on, uh, people are actually listening, they are interested in these visitors, Paul and Barnabas, it was disturbing. It was disturbing for the Jews. So we read verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. So you notice the uh, atmosphere changes from one of welcome and applause to one of opposition Okay, and condemning and blaspheming. So it's a very tough situation now for Paul and Barnabas. Okay, so when the time gets, when, when things get tougher, how did they respond in the city? Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. So they just decide okay, that uh, if the Jews who have uh, this uh, this beautiful heritage of the scriptures uh, are not willing to listen 
no they they now make a decision that we are going to start proclaiming the truth of the gospel to the gentiles so when there is an open door you know you will notice this everywhere when there's an open door uh the uh, like the teams that are that are ministering in this case Paul and Barnabas they go uh, and they proclaim the gospel but when the doors shut okay uh, it, it is like they find another open door and they go there and they begin to proclaim so now that they understand the Jews are unwilling they say that they are going to begin to preach to the Gentiles so verse 48 now when the Gentiles heard this they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed so even in the midst of opposition there is strategy God given strategy Jews are not listening leave it preach to the Gentiles there is fruit that they preach to the Gentiles they believed okay uh, and verse 49 and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium so what's happening the prominent people of Antioch of Sidia are now strongly opposing Paul and Barnabas and they came to the extent of removing them expel them from the region so they removed from there so they moved to the next opportunity which is in the city of Iconium okay uh, and the people of Iconium disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit so they're just continuing their ministry if one city does not accept them they just go to another city where people are accepting them and they continue the work so that is Acts chapter uh, 13 for us and uh, we will soon go to Acts 14 where we will see more of the ministry in um, Iconium and uh, a place called Lystra and, you know different things that took place there uh, but any any thoughts as of now any um you know something that uh stood out for you in act 13. Can I say something, Pastor? Yes, Charles. Um, I'm looking at the, when, the, when you are expecting praise, warm welcome, but now it becomes the other way around. So I, I learn that whatever we are expecting might not come out the way we expected it, but now it's going to do the other way around. So... It is to again depend on the Holy Spirit to see on how to handle such situation, especially to remain sober, to remain content, so that you are able not to to misfire, not to to kill ministry, but to handle it well, so that the church is edified. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a, a you know very beautiful thought. Thank you. Charles for sharing we have to keep the ministry going yes there uh, will be acceptance there will also be rejection but you know the work must go on um, all right so Louis I see that you've raised your hand please share your view good morning pastor good morning everyone um, I think my view is be slightly different from Brad Charles uh, because for the first time I read that um, I kind of saw a pattern uh, if I'll call it that, where I think God was directing them into the core of their ministry because when he told the elders to separate them, he didn't tell them specifically what he was going to give them, what the work was. He just said to a work that I will show them. Um, and immediately the Bible says they traveled into the regions where they went. And the first thing, the place, first place they went to was to the Jews which they were kind of comfortable with, got back their own people. You know, but as time went on, they began to understand, as Paul says, this, the grace to the Gentiles was given to me and the grace to the Jews were given to Peter. So I think, in a way, God systematically drew Barnabas and Paul into the, the, the people he wanted them to have 
the, the Ministry of Reconciliation with. So the, the confrontation was like a blessing in these guys because now Paul had to focus on the Gentiles that were receptive of his message. You know, so in that in that that looked like a criticism or rejection it was like God putting pulling them into the core of their ministry so that they are working in his perfect will. Because when they walked in, the gospels opened up to the Gentiles, and that's how Paul, you know, basically found that okay, it seems like the grace of God is for me to work with the Gentiles, and that way, um, even though I want to preach to the Jews, but the grace of God upon my life is to work with the with the Gentiles. So sometimes certain confrontations we find is God is directing our steps, or uh, our minds to what He wants for us, and it might come in confrontation, people um, rejecting. Our message, but God saying there are some people that will accept your message, so we are flexible in that regard. And I'm not saying, okay, because it's the gospel, I must preach to the Jews, and the Jews are rejecting, and I say, no, I must preach to them. Now, maybe that's the way it's something God has to navigate our our path, even in ministry and in life. You know, just my observation. Yes, yes, thank you, Louis. Uh, yes, thank you for noticing that. Uh, what we see here is that even though you know circumstances aligned in a certain way uh, what ultimately happened is god's purpose for uh, paul's ministry you know, he was called to the gentiles he was an apostle to the gentiles and uh, uh, it it took place you know though they were adverse circumstances uh, it did not stop the purpose of God from unfolding in his life so uh, did god cause the persecution to happen I would say no. I would say that God knew what would happen, and that is why, uh, you know, uh, He was leading them in a certain manner. There's a scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah 46 and verse 10, which says, "God knows the end from the beginning." So God knew the responses of the people in uh, Antioch, and uh, you know, later on, now we'll see the responses of the people in Iconium. So knowing what would happen, the Holy Spirit was directing. Paul uh, into his ministry for the Gentiles. Okay, so um, yeah, good things to think about. At this point, let's go in for a break. Uh, it's 9.54. So we'll take a 10-minute break and let's come back at 10.04 and uh, pick up from here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> 